Thank you for joining us today. My name is Liliana Wong. I am marketing and IR at Everm Resources. We are an exploration company based in Vancouver. Um, we look for gold, copper, and silver in North America. And I put this session together with a group um, of other people in mining, uh, millennials in mining, actually. We have been noticing that there's not that many people talking about um, the mining sector um, relating to investments. If we talk to family members or friends or even in the news, a lot of the talk about making money in the stock market goes to tech companies, cannabis companies. And um, we were thinking, well, it's probably time for somebody to tell the general public more about how to make money in gold. So here we are. Um, this is our first session. We were hoping to have a live event in Vancouver in June, and we were putting a lot of time and effort um, planning that event. But unfortunately, since the pandemic happened in March, um, we're going to be delaying that event probably until next year. So in the meantime, we are bringing you webinars to give you more information about gold and other metals. Um, we're always open to feedback. So if you are interested in learning about making money, investing in silver or other precious metals, um, or what is the difference between investing in ETFs and royalty companies. Um, all these terms can be a little confusing for the general public. So please send us an email um, or contact me directly later and I'll put together more webinars um, so we can discuss those topics. Um, before we get started, I will, I will just, um, ask everybody to send their questions um, via chat. Um, there's an option underneath the screen where you can send questions. Just make sure you add the name of the speaker that you're directing the question to. And um, yeah, at the end, if the questions haven't been covered during the presentations, then um, we'll go on one by one and answering those questions. And again, if uh, for some reason you have further questions after the presentations and we're not able to cover them, please send us a message and um, I will, we will get back to you. Um, so now we're going to start the webinar. Um, first speaker will be Mark, Mark Stacy from AGF. He is the head of portfolio management at, at AGF Investments. Um, Mark began his career at AGF as part of a high street investment management team and has been in the industry since 2002, applying quantitative and qualitative management techniques to the portfolio management process. And then we'll have Jaime Carrasco from Canaccord Genuity, his VP Investment Advisor and Portfolio Manager. Jaime has garnered a reputation for questioning and challenging the status quo and exploring the most innovative investment strategies. You may have seen him on BNN, Bloomberg, and the market call segment. Um, he offers fresh, market perspectives on global financial and geopolitical landscape, helping investors adapt to hidden opportunities and risk. Um, so we'll go on with uh, Mark first. Great, thank you. So thanks for joining. I think Liliana um, did a great intro in terms of, uh, you know, there's a lot of investments that people are talking about and one of them is not gold. I think there's a number of reasons why people have not been investing in gold. But, but now is the time to consider it uh, and it should be part of your portfolio. And I'm going to outline, you know, why uh, people have not been uh, looking at gold and uh, what's the backdrop that's causing people not to invest in gold and gold stocks. I think we're at a tipping point. And I also think there's a good compelling reason as we build our portfolios going forward that gold should be a part of our portfolios uh, because it adds a lot of benefit of diversification and downside protection. And so why, why are investors not buying uh, gold and gold stocks? Well, the macro and the market backdrop does matter. And one of the big reasons why people have not been investing in gold is because of US dollar strength and, and commodities trade inversely to the, to the dollar. And this is the US dollar, the DXY against that. So it's against a basket of major currencies. And it's, uh, you'll notice that since back in 2010 and even a little bit before, the US dollar increased versus the rest of the world's currencies. In fact, up 36.5% in 
Now you notice that re more recently, it's been at that 100. The other reason that investors have not been investing in gold is because in, it's often viewed as an inflation hedge and inflation has been muted despite the efforts of various central banks to increase inflation. This is the, the U.S. Uh, central banks, the Fed's favorite inflationary measure, it's the PCE, and, and they have struggled to get any sort of inflation whatsoever. Uh, but that, that works also, I think, in gold's favor, uh, as we talk about a little bit later. And as well, the other aspect, because the U.S. dollar has been strong, because we haven't had a lot of inflation, you know, people, are, when they invest, they're investing in markets that are less commodity related. And you'll notice that gold, uh, excuse me, the U.S. market since the bottom of the, the financial crisis has been by far the leading market. It's up more than double than the rest of the markets in the world. And so the, the world, as investors, we have been putting our money into the U.S. and less so to the rest of the world. Hi, Mark. Sorry, could you maybe zoom out a little? I think it's over 100% and we're missing the... the okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. How's that? That's good. Thank yeah. you. So, you know, it's the... Perfect. The U.S. is the black, the black line and then the rest of the world, Canada, Europe, emerging markets, and Japan. Thank you, Liliana. So, with that, that in mind, the mar market, the macro backdrop, I do believe we're at a tipping point for gold, and these are the reasons why. I mentioned, I showed you that the VXY was sitting at 100. Uh, one of the aspects that we look, we are a quantitative firm. Liliana mentioned we look at things very mathematical. This is the US dollar, uh, the DXY, and it's rolling 12 month return versus the rest of the world's currency. Uh, and you'll notice that it, from our perspective, it's starting to wane, it's starting to slow down. And so you can see on the scale, uh, zero is, the, is obviously the average in the middle, and then you've got plus or minus 10% on both sides. We have seen instances where the U.S. dollar has had strengthening periods, but you'll notice as we go through 17, 18, 19, and 20, we're starting to see the U.S. dollar start to turn and become, uh, it's actually at the 0% over the last 12 months versus the rest of the world's currencies. So that is a positive as the U.S. dollar decreases versus the rest of the world currencies, that's positive for commodities. The other aspect is, I mentioned that, um, you know, inflation was low, but with the world that we're looking at and the fact that we are starting to get yields, uh, interest rates very low and governments are cutting interest rates, inflation isn't overly high, but it is now high enough to, to generate what we call negative real yields, and negative real yield, yields are positive for gold, You'll notice the gold line is the black line. This goes back to December of 2009. Anytime the real yield turns negative, that inflation is greater than the yield that's being posted, you'll notice that gold has a, has a nice move up. And you can see in the most recent period where we've seen gold move higher as real yields have moved lower. And so that is a benefit to gold. The other aspect is the Fed's balance sheet is increasing dramatically. And so that means they're going to have to, obviously there's increase in money supply. Money supply should hopefully eventually increase and cause some inflation. But it also means that there's, there's concerns about currencies in general, and that should cause the US dollar to decrease as well. Now what's happening in the market and the backdrop of the market for gold and gold stocks and why we think we're at a tipping point. This looks at gold versus U.S. equities and gold stocks versus U.S. equities. It's the price ratio going back in time. And you'll notice from April to 2007, uh, all the way up to the credit crisis uh, of 09 and past a bit, gold was moving higher versus U.S. equities and gold stocks were as well. But for the last number of years, we've seen that decline. And so it has been gold underperforming the U.S. equities and gold stocks performing U.S. equities quite significantly um, for both gold and gold stocks. But more recently, we've started to see gold and gold stocks base and now starting to outperform U.S. equities. Uh, and that's a positive for gold. And we think it's just the bottoming that's beginning. 
I'd also pair when we talk about the U.S. equity market and where people have been investing. This is a price ratio chart of the information technology sector in the U.S. and the gold sector. Uh, and you can see that if you went where we were more recently, gold is now starting to outperform. So if, if the line is going up, information technology is outperforming gold. And if the line is going down, information technology is underperforming gold stocks. And if you go back in time and line it up, the period we are in right now looks very similar to the internet bubble. And so from our perspective, FANG, MEGA, uh, the areas that people have been concentrating their portfolios is at risk. And this is the opportunity to diversify and add something like gold and gold stocks. And we think it's early on. This is the 10 year rolling return of gold. So we're looking at every single day one of the, the, what you're seeing is, is, a, is one of these dots or points is the last 10 year return. And despite the move in gold and gold stocks more recently, it is still very early on when you compare back in history. Back the last time that we saw gold and gold stocks rally back in 02, all the way up to 2011, a 500% 10 year rolling return. Right now, we are at about 40%. So long term, it looks like we are at an inflection point for gold and gold stocks, and it looks from our perspective to be early on. So that is starting to be a tipping point for the sector. So why do you want to add gold and gold stocks to your portfolio? From our perspective, as we all put portfolios together, the asset allocation decision has changed in our perspective. Traditionally, we think of portfolios, we think of a 60-40 balance fund, equities and fixed incomes. As we go forward, I think both equities and fixed incomes are going to have a more difficult time in generating the returns we have in the past. And the th third component we're going to need to think about is alternatives. And gold falls within the alternative space, and I'll show you why in the next slide. But if you look down below in the table, you'll notice the various asset classes. I mentioned the U.S. equity market has been very strong. It's 10 year annualized return, and this is, goes back just before the, the uh, pandemic, was 14% annualized return. On average, it averages 7.6%. Now bonds, particularly the long bond, most people talk about stocks, but bonds over the last 10 years in the US have generated 7.8% on an annualized basis. The average return is 3.1%. So both equities and bonds have had very strong returns and it's likely going to be a little bit more difficult. So we need to add some diversification to our portfolio and something that's going to help us uh, at times when we have some market corrections and gold can serve that purpose. And this really highlights how gold can help out your portfolio and why it's an alternative. When we speak about alternatives, we speak, uh, if you want to simplify it, it's something from my perspective that, that is, uh, moves in a different direction than the rest of your portfolio. It's a hedge or it changes your risk portfolio. And something has changed with gold and gold stocks, and we'll talk a little bit why, and why in the next few slides. If you go back to, these are the, uh, going all the way to 2011, anytime the U.S. equity market has been down 5% or more, and how gold and gold stocks have performed. The blue bar is the S&P 500, the uh, black bar is GLD, and then the uh, XGD is the, um, the other bar, and that, that is the stock. So it's the S&P 500, it's gold, and then it's the stocks themselves. And pre-2016, you'll notice when the S&P 500 went down, gold and gold stocks went down as well. There was, but there has been an inflection point and there's something different about gold and gold stocks going forward because now you'll notice in the last number of, of down moves and corrections in the S&P 500, gold and gold stocks are providing the hedge and being the alternative to the portfolio because they're actually generating positive returns. That's important because if you can have something in your portfolio that generates positive returns in down markets, you can protect your capital, you smooth out your returns, and you get what we call a better risk adjusted return. And you'll notice that in the table, both gold and gold stocks are uncorrelated to the equity market. That is a positive because if we put something together that isn't correlated to the rest of our portfolio, it actually helps reduce our overall risk. 
And so the, you are starting to see from my perspective, gold and gold stocks can be the, the next part of your portfolio as you're building uh, your overall client's uh, portfolio. There also is the aspect, I often get um, a question, what should we put in our portfolio, gold or gold stock? And you notice in the slide before, they both can provide downside protection, but they do move differently. They don't always move in lockstep. This is, as I showed you before, for the US dollar, a 12 month rolling return. It's the spread between gold and gold stocks. You can see for the range, so it goes up, gold is outperforming gold stocks. If it moves down, gold is underperforming gold stocks. And it has a range of about 20%, plus or minus, but it can certainly move outside of that. And right now, you'll notice that gold has underperformed the, underperformed the gold stocks quite significantly. In fact, gold is up uh, about 30% over the last 12 months, gold stocks up 88. And so they both provide protection, but there's an opportunity to tilt between either gold or gold stocks, or at least have some diversification and moving in between the two, because they do move differently uh, at, and, and at different times. As well, I think when you wanna think about gold stocks, and evaluating gold stocks, one of the reasons why uh, you've seen that shift in what people's perspective is of how gold and gold stocks can fit into a portfolio and why they're providing that downside protection is companies have shifted from exploration to execution. This goes back to 2003 and shows where companies have been spending their company. Back in 2003, the bulk of their capital uh, spending was on exploration projects. The problem with these projects is they didn't deliver in terms of a lot of gold, actual uh, uh, properties that they could gold on. So it was wasted money. But as gold um, companies have recognized that they need to be more capitally efficient and investors have focused on companies that are more capital efficient, you've seen a transition from less on exploration and more to later stage and also on the operations they have and how can they be more efficient in those operations. That's a big benefit to investors because what, it is, what has happened is we're starting to see the fundamentals of gold stocks improve and that makes it easier for his investors to invest in gold. They're executing on growth. Margins are improving. They're actually delivering earnings surprises. As investors, we like companies that beat on estimates and beat our expectations. On CapEx, this is important. This is the CapEx versus trend. And you'll notice that there's a, it's a, it runs from 0.4 to 1.4. If it's at one, that means our trend is the same. You'll notice that what's happening is gold companies are decreasing their CapEx expenses versus trend. So they're being more efficient. It will likely lead to less production and less uh, discovery of gold. But for investors, what it does is it increases profitability overall, and you'll notice that the return on the dollars they're investing is going higher. There also leads to generating greater cash flow, which is important because from that cash flow, it turns into as investors, whether it's a gold stock or a mining stock or not, or not, what's important in today's world as well in the low yield environment is that you take, you take the capital, you spend it efficiently, you generate profit and cash flow, but I as an investor expect to get some money back as well. And you're starting to see that um, the dividends are increasing in gold stocks. And that's an important part of what we as investors want to see. And the last part, you'll notice this is the volatility of gold stocks. More recently, it has increased, but the whole market's volatility has increased in the correction. So they have moved in lockstep, but notice that from 2010 to 2016, the volatility, the price volatility of gold stocks increased steadily all the way up to a 35% uh, price volatility over 30, 30, 300 days. As investors, when we think about in, investing in companies, we're looking for companies that can deliver on operations, but also have lower volatility. It's very difficult to allocate to companies when you're seeing ever increasing volatility, but the increased execution by the companies has led to lower volatility. So when you put it together, the fact that the fundamentals are improving, that it's a different asset allocation, we can now consider as investors both gold 
and gold stocks in the portfolio and the benefits that they've always had are more important than they than they ever have been in today's environment. So I'm going to, uh, that's, I'm going to leave it there. I think we're going to do questions at the end, but I appreciate everyone uh, listening and I think uh, I'm going to turn it back to you, Liliana. Thanks, Mark. Um, yes, we, if you have any questions about the, the presentation that Mark just shared, please put them on the Q&A at the bottom and we'll go through them at the end. I see there's already one question, but um, John, if you don't mind adding, um, if that's for both uh, speakers or just for Mark, I'll we'll appreciate it and we'll go through that later. Jaime. Okay. Um... Thank you for having me. I'm going to take a different tack in, uh, in, in my presentation in that I'm going to use history because history is the why of, my, of the reason why I like gold. Now, first of all, I've been in the business for 31 years now. Um, and early on in the, in the industry, I was lucky enough to have been uh, the repo trader uh, for Gordon Capital. Now, repo is debt, the short-term debt between the players. But during that tenure, I was lucky enough to uh, have been mentored by the last generation of bond traders who have worked under a gold standard. So they installed in me um, an understanding of gold that is different than today, because I do think that one of the problems with gold today is that we have a generational gap. It's in that we have not worked within a gold, gold back system for a very long time or a sound money system since about 1971. And to some extent we have forgotten um, what gold is now. Uh, I manage two portfolios. One of them is a 100% um, invested in the precious metals uh, sector. And the other one is an equity income portfolio, which also has gold. Um, what I wanna do through this presentation is get to the why of the, the gold portfolio, but also give you an understanding of the connection between gold and credit. Uh, J JP Morgan said a long time ago that gold is money and all, all, less in, all else is credit. Now this is very important because throughout history, um, there's been a connection between gold and, and debt. Um, one of the, the area that I think we should focus in, he, we are right here, what we're looking at here is the currency reserve. So the, 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 the changes that the monetary system has had over time and how it's been, it's transferred over time uh, through gold and power. It's one of the reasons why um, one of the rules of power is that he who holds the gold makes the rules. Now we are right now right here at the end of this road, but it's very important to understand the period of transfer of power from the pound to the dollar. Now at that point we were working it within a gold standard, but, and today we're not. Today we're working within what's called a fiat system. Now it's not the first time we have worked with it. We have been working within a fiat system. The last time had been at this point in the late 1770s when the French controlled the power. Now, it's important to understand that it took us 200 years to forget the importance of gold within the, the, within the monetary system. Now, um, one of the things to understand about these periods of change of transfer of power is that they are periods of extreme economic and geopolitical um, fluctuation and issues. Um, one of the things with when power transfers from France to the UK was that by then the UK held the most reserves, gold reserves. And that's why they were able to set the gold standard. It was actually Isaac Newton and John Locke that, that, that set up that standard and it worked for 200 years. Um, within my uh, LinkedIn page, you will find a really good documentary called In Money We Trust, which is the history of money. One of the things that we've never done is, is really have a clear understanding of how money works and how, and how the power has transferred uh, throughout time. Now, this is what I want to address going forward. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in more and more until we get to today. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to look at this area here. Ever since the U.S. took over the, the current currency reserve, meaning the U.S. dollar has been the main currency of trade within the, within the global economic system since about 1933. Um, these red periods are the periods that I think we should focus in because these are the periods of, of biggest monetary change within the last 100 years. First of all, um, we should concentrate on 1975 for a second because 1975 was when we finally came off a gold, a sound-based money system when Nixon unpacked gold 
from, um, um, from the currency. Up to that point, the dollar was backed by the gold reserves within the country. Now, if you can see in this chart, we're looking at the monetary base of a country, the money that's, that's being created versus gold reserves and how those have increased in value. What had happened by 1975 here is, is if you can see the, the decline in price was the fact that at that point, um, we had been, um, or the, the, the banking system had been trying to maintain the price of gold from accelerating because demand was increasing at a high pace. That forced uh, the closing of the London gold pool, which allowed gold to begin to, to rise, but it also gave birth to the current debt-based monetary system. Before we go there, I think we should go back to this period here to understand the opportunity, because the, the, the biggest opportunity occurred in 1933. Now, we've heard Ray Dalio mention the connection between gold, uh, sorry, between 1933 and today, the parallels of that period, and he's also talked about the, par the paradigm shift that's in front of us. So let's look at 1933 for a second. The 30s was a period of, of ultimate debt growth. By that point, we had come out of the Second World War. Governments were in high levels of debt. And one of the problems was that from a debt perspective, we had reached uh, maximum utility. What that meant was that any more debt wasn't creating any further growth. Now, at that point, um, you had massive unemployment around the world. You had populist governments rising. Uh, Trump is a great example of a populist um, leader. You know, he's not the political choice, but he was elected. You had massive dislocation between rich and poor, which we're starting to see again. But more importantly, uh, the problem was debt. At that point, we had to find a way to unwind debt. Well, in 1933, uh, Roosevelt transfers the power from the pound by allowing the fact that by then the US had 8,900 tons of gold of the then circulating 29,000 to create the brand new dollar. That's the, 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 the birth of the dollar occurs in May of 1933. When, when Roosevelt says from this point forward, we're gonna create a brand new dollar backed by the 8,900 tons of gold that we have, you won't be able to buy gold, but you'll be able to convert the dollar for gold. And that gives rise to the US dollar um, as we knew it until 1975. What's important though, is that these are periods of extreme danger, but I would say danger or economic danger written within the Chinese way of writing it with two, with two symbols, the symbol for risk and the symbol for opportunity, because it was also a period of much opportunity in that if you had had $7,000 worth of gold at the beginning of the, of, the, of the depression, by the end of the depression, you walked away with $35,000 because gold had to rise from seven to $35 um, through that currency adjustment. Now, the main beneficiaries though were the companies and at the time, Homestake Mining and Alaska Juno were the Gold Corp and the Barrick of the time. Now, an investment in homestake mining at the time would have yielded an investor that had seven thousand dollars worth at the beginning of the at the beginning of the of the depression, almost eighty five thousand dollars plus a ten percent dividend by the end of the depression. We can see what happened to the stock of homestake mining. The reason for this is because prior to that adjustment, they're producing at five dollars. All of a sudden, they're selling at thirty five. They're making a lot of money, and the dividends started growing and the dividend was yielding about 10% through the depression. So these were the best safe harbors through one of the worst cri economic crises the world had seen in the, past, in the past century. Now, let's move forward to, um, to the other area, which is where we are today. I began, started, I started investing in gold in 2006 because I also noticed that central banks had started to um, to print quite a bit of money to deal with problems. This was prior the, to, to the problems in 2008. Another issue that I saw from a debt perspective was the problems that were starting to arise within the repo sector. Let me back up because repo is an important thing to understand because one of the questions that was asked earlier was, or, or prior was, is COVID-19 accelerating the demand for gold or not? Well, I'm gonna say that whatever problems were in place prior to COVID-19, they had already begun. And 
Just like in 2008, the repo market was sending that signal. What happened into, first of all, what is repo? Repo is, the, is, is me representing Gordon Capital borrowing money from, from, from Royal Bank or, from, or Goldman Sachs borrowing from JP Morgan. By default, those guys can borrow from the Fed at very low rates. So the amount at which they trade is very small. So in 2008, 2007, they were borrowing from the Fed at 4% and lending to each other at four and a quarter. All of a sudden in, in the fall of 2008, repo rates jumped to 6%. So automatically for me, that was a signal that there's a 50% increase in the loss of trust within the players. Last year, in the fall of October of, of 2019, rates jumped from 2% to 10%. To me, that was a massive warning that something's awry within the system. Now, whatever was going on then has accelerated because of COVID-19. So I think the demand for safe haven is even greater. But let's back up. Uh, back in 2006, uh, gold had a, a great rise. Uh, within in price where it went from about six hundred dollars up to nineteen hundred dollars. Now the this point here to me uh, once we got to twenty eleven that was a normal consolidation of the price. This here becomes the 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 main opportunity that I saw coming into gold. Now the way that I played it going up to two thousand and eleven. Um, and again, I I'm not a gold bug. I am more of a debt uh, bear. I just feel very concerned about the great levels of debt that we have in the system today, similar to the 30s, but they're exponentially greater. Now this here, this decline in, in this correlation that gold had to money uh, that had existed for a long time is an opportunity because I would say that this is because of manipulation within the future contracts of the price by allowing for, for the selling of paper contracts that are not backed by physical gold. So in essence, they're not selling physical gold. What they're doing is selling paper contracts. The best analogy I can, I can explain it is the game of musical chairs where you have less and less chairs, gold chairs, because they're being pulled out. But at the same token, you have more and more people running around those chairs because they're buying a contract that gives them participation in that gold. Just to make the point, in March alone, uh, the LBMA sold in paper contracts 32,000 tons of gold. Well, that's all the gold held by all central banks. How can that be when that gold isn't trading? Well, this is just paper trading. Now, keep that in the back of your head because it's one of the issues I have with owning ETFs within the system. Um, I also think that this is the biggest opportunity because this means that gold has to catch up. The other thing to point out as well is that this line here started to decline and now it's gone exponential. Now this is all central banks, the European Central Bank, the Fed, Bank of Japan, uh, the Swiss National Bank and the, uh, pe the, the, the People's Bank of China. So money printing globally has gone exponential and, I, and to me that is the opportunity because it's, uh, as Mark had pointed earlier, uh, negative rates. Like the 30s, today we are at uh, zero rates. There's no marginal utility from any more debt, which means that going forward, we're gonna see similar patterns as the 30s in that we are not gonna get any economic growth. We will get greater and greater social dislocation. And by the same token, something needs to be done. In the 30s, we did it by creating a brand new currency reserve. Now let's look at the opportunity. Um, the two stars are important because in 2015, I was, I was at Scotia dealing with, uh, I was a representative between Scotia, Canada and Chile representing or managing all of the high net worth and, and, uh, and family offices in Chile. Now, the one thing I noticed was that everybody was invested like our clients here, they would be dealing with an American or a European outfit and have no participation in the precious metals. So that's when that gave rise to what became my special opportunities portfolio, which is my, my standalone gold, um, gold portfolio. In that, at that point, I realized if I can offer any value added to these people is to set up a portfolio that would allow them to take participation in the gold sector um, as a standalone solution. So um, 
one of the things that I look at within portfolio management is asset allocation. At that point, back in, 20, in, in 2011, I had allowed gold to run up, but through that correction, I had cut back my, per, my participation in gold to 15% of the portfolio. By, uh, that's within the, the equity income portfolio. By this point, I was only holding about 10% of the portfolio in precious metals when this was structured. Now, this was also structured when gold hit a $1,000 uh, $1, price. Now, what we're looking at here, by the way, is the HUI, which is the sector index, the, the, the blue line. Uh, it's, the, it's the sector index of the top 20 gold miners in the world, gold and silver miners in the world, and the price of gold. As you can see, there's been a very good correlation within those two. The portfolio was set up at this point. At this point, um, the industry had already gone, and that's in 2015, had already gone through a massive cleansing. So a lot of the producers had already gone through quite a bit of, of turmoil, and I thought that would have been the best time to acquire, start acquiring uh, a participation in the sector. Now, at that point, producers and royalties made a lot of sense because they were trading ridiculously cheap. Uh, and, through that point, we gold hit a bottom and it started moving higher. And however, um, the producers had a bit of a spike, but then they've gone sideways. And that's created another opportunity because the benefit of the producers themselves is that the producers have not caught up to the price of gold. Now, the price of gold is rising for various reasons. The main reason is the fact that, as Mark pointed out, going forward, the, the all central banks are at zero rates, meaning that they will not be able to stimulate the economy for much because we know from past experience over the last couple of years that they need at least a, a, a 3% decline in rates to really stake the, the economy. Well, we're starting from zero. So going forward, it's all negative rates. So that's why I'm of the belief that gold needs to continue rising higher because it's the ultimate or the one of the best hedges for negative rates. Why is it the best hedge for negative rate? Because gold is the only asset that is nobody's liability. Everything else is somebody else's liability. Now, the benefit is that the price of the producers, the, considering the earnings that they have, they've just begun to break out higher to catch up to gold. So that is number one, to me, the, one of the best opportun investment opportunities right now. Now let's focus in on the next point, which is October 1, 2015. I started tracking gold, the Dow, and the producers on October 1, 2018, because again, back to debt. That was the point at which the Fed had, had, was forced to begin lowering interest rates because they lost control of the, of the stock market. From October of 2018 to, to January of 2019, the market began a, a big decline, forcing the Fed to reverse rates rising. And started creating quite a bit of, of trouble for the Fed and the markets. They needed to stimulate the Dow. At that same point, gold began its, its, its to really run up and the producers have had another similar uh, spike. The numbers here, they're not, they're not showing very well, but had you invested $1 in the Dow uh, on October 1, 2018, in the Dow gold and the precious metals, today the Dow, is, this is, these numbers are as of Friday, the Dow would yield a negative return of 12%, uh, gold would be up 46%, and the HUI is up 92%. So the, to me, we've already begun a stealth uh, outperformance, or this bull market has already begun, but nobody's noticing because everybody's still thinking of the Dow. One of the main, one of the main things within the portfolio is that at this point, it began to change. Because, um, because initially the portfolio had producers, uh, good quality producers and, and, um, and royalty companies. What I started adding at this point were, were, were projects that have been dormant. There's a lot of companies that needed to go dormant and they haven't really gotten started again. And that, that was when we started buying them throughout last year because these companies will have to get rebuilt. As the industry starts to pick up and rebuild, um, all of these projects are gonna come alive. Uh, are gonna come alive. One of the things that I have to say is that 
gold is rising with rising with systemic risk. That's something that is done for 4,000 years as well. And the company's earnings are also rising. We're seeing it in, in a lot of these comp great companies in Canada. So the first advice I would, I, would, I would give anybody is to make sure that you have a good selection of producers and royalties as your foundation. Because right now there's very little risk within those in that they, the earnings or the, the, the prices of the companies have not caught up anywhere near where gold is. So no point going out the risk spectrum just yet. Uh, I think that that good quality companies is the, the way to go. I have four criteria within my portfolio when looking at companies. Those are good quality uh, management, the best management with high reserves on the ground because at some point reserves on the ground are gonna have a lot of value and I'll touch base in a second. Low cost of production in geopolitically safe uh, places. I think if you can look at those four criteria, you'll find a good selection of companies. Reserves on the ground are key because go back to the, to the analogy I gave of musical chairs where we're taking the chairs away, but the music's going to stop. At that point, there's going to be only one place to buy gold, and that's going to be the, with, from the companies, exactly as it was with Homestake Mining in the 30s. And that's why I think the companies will yield a will yield, uh, great return. One of the other things that's also occurred since 2015 is a lot of companies have started to pay or increase dividend. So we're starting to see those cash flows come in just like in the 30s. Okay? Um, um, one other thing is within that, also the consideration for more um, uh, accredited investors and high net worth people is flow throughs. Flow through investing for, for the resource sector, it's kind of one of the only benefits that the government really has to, to, to lower taxes. It's a tax deferral, but the government allows for resource companies exploring in Canada to pass through their exploration um, expenses to shareholders. So flow through investing for the sector also makes sense. The opportunity is, is that if the 30s are replaying as I think they are because of monetary issues, gold needs to rise a lot more because we're going to have to figure out a way of dealing with the debts the same way we have in the past. Um, I'm going to leave you with, with one last quote, and that's from Jesse Livermore, that it was never my thinking that made me big money for me. It was sitting. Got that? By sitting tight. Now, Jesse Livermore was um, a, a stock speculator in 1929. In my opinion, he was one of the best traders. And he made almost $500, um, $100 million in 1929 dollars. So he was very witty, uh, very good at, at trading. But he also understood that one of the best things is to have good positions and wait on them. And that's been my, my, my strategy all along. One last thing is that my asset allocation now within the equity income, equity income portfolio is up to 30% um, um, of that portfolio is in precious metals because I do think that this wave has begun. One of the benefit of, benefits of asset allocation is that if you take a stake of 10% and something becomes 15, it'll, it'll automatically allow you to sell and reduce the position and buy into something else. That's why the portfolio has outperformed the HUI is that discipline of investing. Uh, one last cautionary note is the fact that with ETFs, one of the problems with ETFs, especially something like the GLD, um, Egon von Greyers, who's very tight with the, with the refiners out of Switzerland, which 80% of refined capacity, pointed out that they've just added um, about 100 tons of gold to their portfolio, but Switzerland being 80% of the refined capacity in the world hasn't sent any gold to London. So where's that gold coming from? So again, that, that game of musical chairs, I think is important to understand when looking at, at the gold market. That's it for my presentation in terms of the, the why of uh, why I like gold. Great, thank you so much to both of you. Um, I see that uh, a few people messaged me on the chat asking for the slides, so I guess we'll have them available after. And I'm also reminding everybody we will have a recording available soon uh, this week probably on the Quorum 2020 website. Um, and I will send it also to all the subscribers um, that got their emails on our list. Um, now I will go over the questions quickly. Um, question for Mark from John. The major and mid cap gold producers are up over 100% in the past six weeks. Are you a buyer of gold shares now or do you anticipate some short term weakness? 
Uh, so, yep, that's a great question. Uh, if I were to position the portfolio in gold, as I said, like gold and gold stock, I would want the physical right now. And when I evaluate, we're going to see the earnings from the mid caps and the large caps come here shortly. They're going to have to be, they're going to be good, I think. They're going to increase their dividends. But quite frankly, I think they moved a little bit too fast. I wouldn't short, I would not short this right now, but I would think there would be some pause or a bit of a correction in, in gold stocks. One of the things that we look at is the price to book of gold stocks. Currently, they trade about two and a half times booked. That's quite high versus history. Once you get over two, I, I personally get a little bit at least nervous. What's going to happen, though, is they're going to have good earnings. It's going to flow through to the, to the book value, and they are going to just over time become a little bit cheaper, but I would expect a bit of consolidation. But if I were to tilt between the two, I would own gold right now versus gold stocks. And over a one-year period, as I mentioned, gold stocks are up over 88%. Gold itself is only up 34%. So that would be how I would think about positioning. Uh, um, now that you're talking between gold and gold stocks, um, is there a spread or a percentage you like to see between producers, uh, developers of stores, or royalties, or ETFs? N no, I think, I mean, that was, uh, I think as long as, I think you can use them the same, quite frankly. And if you get in that in that 20% range, and if you monitor that, that can help you. You know, as Jaime mentioned, that he talked about sitting and waiting. And if it if you get paid off and it increases, in, if it's part of your portfolio at 10%, it outperforms, it becomes 15%. You can think of it the same way if you have a diversified portfolio of gold and gold stocks, because they're obviously you can see they move. And from Jaime's slide, they don't move in tandem. So as one outperforms you can pair some of that back and put it into the, to the gold stocks and, and you can trade a little bit around. Now, obviously physical gold is a little bit tough to, you know, you have to be careful about how you're trading it and getting access to it. Um, but you can certainly, I know Jaime mentioned uh, the gold ETFs is concerned about it, but they're obviously in, the, in those tactical trades that gives you that opportunity. Do you want to add anything to that, Jaime? Um, I would like to add that, that, um, he makes a good point in that the, the producers have moved quite a bit. I think they have a long way to go to catch up to gold at 1700. So I would not, I would more advise clients that, you know, everybody I meet, especially millennials or the, they don't have any gold participation. I would say, take a, take a stake. Um, Ibbotson uh, has always said seven to 10% in normal times. These are not normal times. So if you gotta if if you have to take a stake, I'm recommending at least 30% of any uh, of investors' investable assets, and within that, just find good quality companies uh, or gold. Now I do see gold as cash, so to I, I'm holding quite a bit of cash in the equity income portfolio, 30%. Uh, a third of that is sitting in physical gold because to me, gold and silver are money, so I I have it as a cash component. The the speculation is in the companies, and within that. Um, I look at good quality producers that, that um, uh, again, within the four criteria. One last thing, I just started adding exploration, but very little. I, I feel that there's no need to risk within the exploration spectrum, but um, uh, as a percentage of the portfolio, 10% of, the, of, the, of my precious metals holding will be in exploration companies because that's where you get a, quite a bit of upside. But right now, considering the value of the companies, of the producers, I think it's a good time to take a stake in that and just wait on it. Thanks. And you mentioned your criteria for choosing the producers in your portfolio. What would be the criteria used for exploration companies? Almost the same thing. Good management, a management team that knows where they are. Um, one of the, um, uh, where the areas are, if you look at North America, a lot of uh, a lot of companies have, uh, sorry, a lot of, uh, the, all of North America has been prospected. So it's hard to find good exploration places there. Uh, Latin America is a place that I look at. Colombia is just getting opened up, Ecuador. Um, Argentina has, uh, has areas. Africa concerns me because of the geopolitics. I don't understand it. The same thing with Asia. Uh, Canada and, and, and the U.S., there are still some, some good projects, but um, again, the, the producers I would definitely recommend if you, if just to build positions and wait. Okay, I see another question here um, about both of you, the outlook that you see for gold in the next two years. Um, maybe we can 
we can add to that. Do you see a support or a resistance level for gold that people can be kind of looking out for? Mark, you want to start and I'll... Sure, absolutely. So um, we don't spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out a number for gold and what the price is going to be. I think that's, um, that can be difficult. Uh, the way I think about it, and that's why I looked at those various uh, charts and the way we evaluate it, I think about it relative to the other opportunities I have within the market, where it is today, where it has been versus history. And when you when you look at it, that's why I mentioned it is a tipping point for gold and gold stocks. They have started to move uh, a little bit, uh, and they look pretty good. But that's really only only the tipping point. So if I look at you know gold versus the U.S. equity market, gold versus IT and gold stocks as well, and the rolling gold and performance of gold, uh, the opportunity is still very early on. If you don't have any exposure, to be able to to add, to add some in your portfolio. So, and, and I know the backdrop is good. The fundamentals are improving. I don't see that changing. So that's all positive. And then it's just finding the best opportunities within gold and gold stocks. I think you can get caught up a lot because um, we can see the gold, gold can move uh, pretty, pretty violently at times. If you see, we saw some liquidation in the market and gold and gold stocks got caught up in there. Um, but, but from my perspective, I'd rather focus on the relative opportunity then getting caught up on what the actual uh, trying to get a gold cool price because I think that somewhat misses the opportunity and and the point of investing in gold. Yeah, actually, if if um, that's a good point, I think gold's going higher. I'm not going to start to speculate where it's going. I can tell you that the price of silver needs to go a lot higher for sure from where it's currently trading because the gold to silver ratio is at a ridiculous over 100 times. Now that doesn't make sense considering for 4,000 years, the average has been around 35. So there's a lot more benefit to silver than gold. Uh, silver has always been poor man's money. Um, um, it's also more rare. So I can assure you that silver is definitely going higher than the $15 and should be trading north of 50. There's where I can definitely give you a price. My strategy for silver, I have been buying a lot of silver coins, but it's to convert them to gold when that ratio corrects. I also like silver producers because of that. As for gold itself, I can, I can tell you that if we are going through a monetary shift or a paradigm shift as Ray Dalio expect, as I expect, and you look at debt versus gold, um, the ratio by which it has to rise is greater than the 30s because we have exponentially greater debts. In order to write off those debts, we have to go five times higher than it currently is, and that's a great opportunity. Within that, the the better benefit will be to the producers because they will really rip higher. So my strategy again is to, that's why the sit tight, buy right and sit tight, I think applies to this and you have to have a disciplined strategy on how to, how to play it. Uh, one other thing is that the volatility, I've gotten used to the volatility since 2015, it's all over the place and what we're seeing now, I think it's just gonna get worse going forward. But one thing I can assure you is that more and more money is gonna filter into the sector. One of the reasons why we have that spread between the HUI and gold is because there is no participation. Nobody's looking at this sector. It's very little and it's gonna come in. So um, I, I think it's a matter of waiting for it and be patient. But there's a lot of cheap companies to be had right now. Great, um, another question here. Gold has performed very well um, and a number of gold producers like B2Gold have already had good runs and are trading at all time highs. Do you see more potential in those same large cap producers or is it time to look lower down the food chain and purchase mid or small cap producers now? Um, let me answer that because within the, the structure of my portfolio, what I'm doing again, asset allocation. So within the main portfolio, which is all in gold, not all in gold, 10% is, in, is, in, is, is, is outside of gold. Uh, but the gold component, uh, what I do is that I hold 30% in good quality um, producers. As those become a greater amount, I will trim them back and use it to add other companies. So I'm using asset allocation as my, my gauge to buy or sell companies. Um, one company that I can talk about because it's no longer in the portfolio was North American Palladium, which was part of the portfolio until it got taken out. Well, that had a huge run from 2015 to 2019. I just kept trimming it back 
and buying other companies along the way. So using that strategy has allowed me to actually acquire more shares. That's why I think a disciplined strategy is important. Your question was, would I be moving out the risk spectrum? Not necessarily. What I'm doing is holding on to the good quality companies and using the growth to add more within the others, but I'm holding on to them. So to me, it's the foundation of the portfolio. I'm holding on to it. And I think there's still quite a lot of room to go. I think that gold companies right now are trading at, you know, they're reflecting 50, not even $1,100 gold. They have a long way to go. Pierre Lasson made a good point. He said, um, uh, and he, was, he said, if you look at most Canadian companies, they will require about $1,200 Canadian to cover all CapEx, everything. Well, they're selling gold at $2,400 and that value isn't reflected yet. So I would want to see it capitalize on it, but use that right up to add other companies. And I would say that um, it makes some sense to have a broad spectrum, including small cap. I think the one thing you have to think about in, in, as investors, uh, the amount of time and the, the amount of time that you need to take to evaluate companies as you move down the cap spectrum uh, gets much, much higher. So for large cap names, mid cap names, the information is available. You can look at the financial statements. You can get an understanding of what they're doing, where they produce. Uh, as you move down in cap size, you need to spend more time, obviously, on that. So that's one of the things you want to think about. I think about sort of a risk budget when I'm spreading out my risk uh, between the large cap, mid cap, small cap. It's going to be more in large cap, a little bit less in small cap, and even less in, in or mid cap and even less in small cap. Um, and we've also done some analysis looking at stock correlation to the gold price. You know, one of the things that I that I like to see is that the stock actually have cor you know positive correlations to gold price. The gold price goes up, the stock goes up as well. As you tend to move into the smaller cap, because the information is not quite as um, uh, there on a daily basis, and it is based on on finding uh, reserves or finding greater exploration, you get you get less correlation to the gold price. So that is one risk you're taking on. So that's why I like to have smaller weight in in various small caps. But I think you can have a basket, and I still think there's lots of opportunity in the large cap and, and mid cap space. I think it's near the end, to be honest, and your biggest payoff is where you get near the end of the cycle is when the small cap is where you want to have a little bit more weight. But right now, I still think there's, there's good opportunity, despite what we see as small moves, relative to where they were before, still very early on the large cap and mid cap space. Thank you. Um... Steve here is asking, if gold is an only a hedge once things have returned to normal, do you think the price will be going back down or is it going to be consistently going higher from here for a few more years? Um, how long do you think it will run? So uh, I, can, I can start off and, and say that, you know, that, that's part of why you buy a, buy a hedge. Um, I know we can get caught up. We all do. And we all like to see that our portfolio, all, all aspects of our portfolio are going up all at the same time. But I think that's why it's important. And gold will have some down days and have some downtime. That's the importance of having something that third part of your portfolio that's an alternative. Yes, if it is, it is, if it is negative, it does dampen your returns on the way up. But it's also when the market goes down or there's corrections, it provides you the, the, the dampening of the downside. So it, it really does provide a, a smoothing out of returns. You're, you're cutting off a bit of the top and a bit of the bottom. But I still, I think to get, to, I guess, we step back, that's sort of my general view of asset allocation. But we are a long way from normal. And I think the, that Jaime highlighted it very well. And I think where we are um, in, in the cycle, the cycle of debt, the cycle of currency, that um, gold is still may have some corrections, but there's still a lot of opportunity within the space, the physical and the stocks themselves. And so I wouldn't get, I would again, as Jaime talked about, it's about rebalancing. So when gold does very well in your portfolio, that's okay. Take some of it back. If you want to put it back into your other assets that have the equities and the fixed income that maybe haven't done as well, that's, a, that's part of that, that's part of risk management as well. So you can do it in a number of ways. You can balance between gold and gold stocks, or you can balance between your entire asset portfolio. But I think it's very important to have that hedge in your portfolio going forward from today on. That's why I often speak the, the asset allocation game has changed. The returns we got from equities and fixed income are likely to be not the same. 
and you need to have gold in the portfolio. Um, let me answer that a little bit different, uh, using the words of Terry Duffy, the chairman of the, of the COMEX. Uh, three years ago, he was asked about gold, and I actually have this on my LinkedIn page. His answer was that if you look at gold uh, based on inflation, this was three years ago, gold should be trading around two to $3,000. But if you look at it in relation to what's going on, on around the world, when a guy, the chairman of the COMEX uses those words, the world, uh, what's going on around the world, he's talking about systemic risk. Gold should be trading around five to six thousand dollars, and it isn't. But people are dismissing that fact, and they might not be able to dismiss it forever. What he was really talking about, I think, was the fact that at the COMEX is where the futures are being traded that are suppressing the price. At some point, that is going to break, and we're starting to see it break, right? That's why I pointed out the the game of musical chairs. At some point, gold will emancipate itself, and it's going to find its true value. I think it's much higher than currently is. That's my speculation. I'm also thinking that we are living through, through unprecedented times because of what's going on with central banks. Central banks have been solving a debt problem with debt, with more debt. And that is, as Einstein said, you can continually do the same thing over and over again, expecting the same outcome. Well, that's the definition of insanity. That's why the system has to change. If it changes according to the last 4,000 years, it's gonna change with much greater gold. You're asking this question in early 1929, 1930, we're betting that a currency change is going gonna, is gonna to occur. Gold reached 35 bucks and it stayed there forever. And next time it unpegged, they went up to 800. So gold as money, I think, needs to go a lot higher to reflect the reality of the world we're living in. That's my speculation, but you need a disciplined strategy to, to, to play that. And that's why uh, within the portfolio, what I'm doing is maintaining asset allocations, understanding that it's gonna be volatile and looking for good quality investments. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question. I'm a Forex trader. Currently gold has a high spread. Can you tell me what that is? I don't understand the question myself. A high spread to what? Yeah, can you repeat the question? Um, we can have Kingsley Mock if you can type your question a little better. Um, as a forex trader, he's seeing gold having a high spread and not understanding why that is. Is it the spread to the spot, spot price to physical delivery? If that is the case, there is a, a big spread right now between the price at which you can buy gold and the paper price. Well, that goes hand in hand to the manipulation that I'm talking about. You know, historically, actually, this happened in, uh, in uh, um, when it comes to futures contracts, there's only four months that offer physical delivery. March was the last one when the contract rolled over to the April contract. There was a $50 price difference between April and the June contract, which is the next delivery contract. That has never happened. The only last time it happened was in 1975, for, 1971, which forced Nixon to unpeg because what it's, what, it's, what it's really saying is that the demand for physical is being overwhelmed within the paper market. Historically, uh, for the last number of years, the spread between the April contract and the June contract is no more than five, 50 cents or, or less because it opens up for arbitrage and you can short one by the other and take physical delivery. Right. And that's why that spread never occurs. Well, that spread is there now. So the futures market is signaling that there's problems. Right. Again, how did the GLD get all that gold if we have a shutdown of refiner refineries? That's all paper transactions. That's why I don't trust the ETFs. Right. And and I didn't trust them in 08. Look at what happened in 08 and let's see what happens now. That's why I think physical and owning things is so important going forward and try to stay away from the intricacies of the futures and derivative market that, that I think is creating a, a massive aberration. How can oil trade at minus 20? That is a clear signal that something big is happening within the derivative sector, which is at the basis of the issues within the repo market. And um, this next question, either Mark or Jaime, um, not really, it says given the huge amounts of debt being created and the fact that the debt utility function is so low, are we headed for a depression? What do you think? Mark, you want to take that? I mean, you spent a lot of time on debt. I was going to turn, you spent a lot of time on, on well, debt, which is a big part of your presentation. I am preparing for the worst. 
I think that, um, you know, I'm a sailor and if I see a storm coming, I'm going to lower sails and, and get ready for, to survive through any storm. I think preparation and awareness that something's wrong and how it's going to affect us, you know, that's my concern that people that currently asset allocation of investors in North America is hardly any gold, right? Uh, my my big thing is that I've been listening from prospects. Yeah, my advisor has bought me a little bit of Gold Corp. Well, if you have less than 1% of 1% within the portfolio, it's not going to work much of a hedge. It's like buying $1,000 worth of life insurance, right? Um, I think asset allocation within that, having a, a, a proper allocation within the sector is going to be important to prepare for whatever whatever could happen. I think central banks are losing control. Um, I'm looking at the mechanics. Uh, look at the speech by uh, uh, Mark Carney at Jackson Hole last October, where he said, yes, the currency reserve needs to be unwound. They're talking about it already, about the fact that the dollar as the currency reserve has to, has to finish because of the debts. And he said, what he was really saying is, are we, the IMF, gonna control that process? Well, Trump, when he went to Davos uh, in February, prior to the COVID-19, what did he say at Davos? You are not gonna control that process, we will. So the discussion has already begun. It's being mentioned just that people aren't listening to it because they're not in tune with it. For preparation, I'm ready for that. That's why my portfolio started taking shape way back when, because I was looking at that. I think the only thing I can tell you is when does it hit? At what point does it become an avalanche? I don't know, but at least be ready and be prepared. And that's what I've been doing for my clients for, you know, started seriously doing it in 2015 and, in, and, and, and have been all along. So I've been ringing this bell for quite a while. And I, I would just say, um, I would echo everything that uh, Heidi said. I would say that I don't know if we're headed for a depression. What I, what I would say is that the, amount of debt that we're, we're taking on and printing is not sustainable. And like Jaime said, I don't know when, it's, when something's gonna happen, but at some point you cannot continue to, to sustain and have that level of debt and not have some sort of implications. Um, I think the benefit is it has positive implications for gold and that's, that's really the, the key when I step back and think about adding gold to the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And go through the producers. Once again, I think one of the one of the challenges that we're going to have is that at some point the lights, the music's going to stop. There won't be any chairs left, and the only place to have it is within the producers. And that's why I, I think there's massive value to the producers right now on the gold reserves on the ground. One of the questions that I always get, by the way, is gold going to be um, um, expropriated like like uh, Roosevelt did in 1933. How can they expropriate something that nobody owns? That's the only question I have. So no, I don't think it will be. And the benefit will be through the producers themselves. Um, I have a Bitcoin question. How do you explain that Bitcoin is at 8,000 and gold is only 1,700? Could gold overtake Bitcoin? Let me answer that because <laughs> that's a great question. I see gold as, um, I see, sorry, I see Bitcoin as gold's solution to, to the, the solution to gold's problem. Because to me, the real problem is within currency. People don't understand the difference between money and currency. Currency is just uh, what's back, how is it backed, right? What I like about Bitcoin is that it's electronic currency. Gold cannot be duplicated. I can come up with a Bitcoin and then the Chinese come, with, come up with the Chinese Bitcoin and then the Russians come up with the, with, the, with, the, with the Russian Bitcoin. So from a currency perspective, it can be duplicated. However, gold can't. There's only one. It has been a constant for 4,000 years. And I think that's the important component in that, to me, blockchain, and, and that's the other component within the special opportunities portfolio, blockchain is the solution and currency in a decentralized system. So one of the things to understand about when we've gone in the past through these currency reserve, uh, uh, currency reserve changes is that what comes out at the other side of that is a sound money system. I think blockchain can offer a great solution in that something that can't be messed around and we wouldn't really need the banking system anymore if we're working within a decentralized electronic currency, but you still need a constant by which to measure value. And that's what gold offers, is the constant of the reserves, right? 32,000 tons of physical gold within all central banks or within all nations, 
how do we share that? How do we restructure that, that pool? It's not about price. It, it, the price could go as high as possible, but what currency uh, uh, defines it? And I think that's where blockchain can come in, come in hand. So I don't see them as, as black and white. I see them as parallels, and, but I don't compare the two. Yeah, no, I would agree. I don't. I wouldn't compare the two either. I'm actually never. Uh, it is a good question, and uh, I've never really spent a lot of time thinking about you know analyzing ratios between Bitcoin and gold. Uh, I mean, the one thing I like about gold is actually a physical. It is physical. Uh, it's a tangible. Where Bitcoin is not, as as Jaime said, it's the uh, blockchain and behind it is good. But you know, Bitcoin is at eight, but we've also seen at times where it was twenty, and it has moved down to four. So at least from my perspective, it's when I think about Bitcoin, it is an alternative to the fiat currencies and it has potential. But when I think about gold, I can think about the drivers of gold and relate them to the price of gold. I can less so with Bitcoin and then make, it's difficult to make the relationship together to put them together. So I think they both have merit. Um, so because you need alternatives to two currencies that we have today, but, but I prefer uh personally prefer gold uh and, and the benefits it has and silver <laughs> absolutely i think um we did get quite a lot of questions but we are 18 minutes now over time so i have copied all the questions that we got on the chat and i will be sending those over to our speakers so that we can get those answered to you. And if you're on our email list or if you register to this webinar, you will be getting um, a future email from me with all the answers that we didn't get to, to cover during this session. But um, I wanna thank again our speakers, Mark and Jaime, thank you so much for your input um, on gold. Hopefully this was uh, useful for those of us or those of you who are logging in and just getting started in, in learning about how you can invest and make money in, this, in the gold um, sector, especially in times of crisis. Um, if you can send us some um, topics that you would like us to cover in future, um, future webinars, we'll be happy to go through those. Um, and again, uh, if you want to, to contact us, um, you can go back to the event page, quorum2020.com um and or you can email me um specifically liliana w at everingresources.com i will send everybody a thank you email so you can have everybody's contact details too um and thanks again thanks Jaime and mark thanks liliana great thank you thanks for everyone joining thank you thank you bye